morning. Open your Bibles this morning to the book of 1 Chronicles, chapter 16. 1 Chronicles, chapter 16. I would guess that for people who read their Bible faithfully, 1 Chronicles is probably one of the books that gets very little attention. The reason for that is the first nine chapters are begats. This guy begat this guy who begat this guy who begat this guy. And they're all there for, they're, they're all inspired, they're all there for a reason. But I'll be honest with you, sometimes I'm reading them going, what in the world am I reading? And so what I do when I read through those begats is, first of all, I always try to find people that are recognized. You know, there are some familiar folks in there, uh, Adam and Abraham and the sons of Abraham, and every now and then you'll get somebody that you recognize. But the second thing I do is I always try to pick out the funniest names. I, I, I can't help it. Some of these things, they just, they just make me laugh. Uh, there's, there's a family... Uh, sons of Benjamin, Huppum, Muppum, and Ard. I, I, if, if I was the third brother in that group, I'd be a little curious why they didn't name me, you know, Huppum, Muppum, Buppum. But then again, I'd be kind of glad that I didn't get the Huppum, Muppum, and instead I was Ard. But anyway, anyway, that has nothing to do with the message, but... By the time we get to chapter 16, we see events in the life of King David. I want to preach this morning something that David did. I'm not going to to be expository in this text, but when I was reading this, it, it just triggered a thought in my mind. There's an area of Christian service that is very, very neglected. Even among folks that love the Lord, we have to be careful about not neglecting this area. For people that love the Lord, most every day we'll read our Bible, we'll pray, we're faithful in our giving, we witness to lost people, we come to church when we're supposed to, we live right, we confess our sins. But there's an area that is often neglected, I don't want to preach to you this morning about that. I've never preached a full sermon on this idea, but God just impressed my heart that we as a church, and certainly me as an individual, we need to be reminded of our responsibility to praise God. We need to remember to praise God. Here's the context of the story. The Nowadays, when a person gets saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of that person. If you're saved, God, the Holy Spirit, lives inside of you. In the Old Testament, that wasn't the case. God dwelt between the the two angels, the cherubim, on the the mercy seat of uh, of the the altar. And so... um, It was a sacred place. And so the the, the Ark of the Covenant that had the the two angels, the two cherubims, uh, God gave the specific dimensions to Moses on Mount Sinai. And so when he came down from the mountain, they built that along with the tabernacle. And then they carried the implements of the tabernacle for 40 years all through the wilderness. They came to the end of their journeys in the wilderness. You remember the priest carried that ark into the Jordan River and the waters parted. They carried it around the walls of Jericho and when they settled in the land, uh, in in the town of Shiloh, they established the tabernacle. But then there came a war with the Philistines And uh, the sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, thought, you know, if we could take the Ark of the Covenant into battle, that would be a good luck charm for us. Let me remind you of something. God is not a good luck charm. And so they carried that Ark into the battle, and the Philistines defeated Israel, and they stole the Ark of the Covenant. But because it wasn't in a place that it was supposed to be, caused all kinds of problem for the Philistines, and so they sent it back to Israel on a cart. It arrived to the house of Abinadab, where it stayed for 20 years. 
And now David has become the king, and he says, we need to get the ark and bring it back to Jerusalem. And so the ark is carried back to Jerusalem. It's set up, and we come to this specific passage, and I want you to notice what David did regarding the ark. If you're able to stand, stand with me, please. And we'll begin in the very first verse of 1 Chronicles chapter 16. The Bible says, So they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tent that David had pitched for it. And they offered burnt sacrifices and peace offerings before God. And when David had made an end of the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. And he dealt to every one of Israel, both man and woman, to every one a loaf of bread and a good piece of flesh and a flagon of wine. And he, appointed, and he appointed certain of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord and to record and to thank and praise the Lord God of Israel. Heavenly Father, I ask you to bless this message this morning. Pray it be a help to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated, please. They set the Ark of the Covenant up. Uh, it, it was in the midst of this tent, this tabernacle that David had set up. This was going to be the place where they worshiped God. This was going to be the place where Israel would come to uh, give offerings because of their sins, to give offerings for thanksgiving. Until the temple was built, this is where everybody came to worship God. And so when it was set up, the first thing David did was he offered offerings, burned offerings. Those are thanksgiving. Thanksgiving to God for bringing the ark back safely. Thanksgiving to God for his blessings. And then peace offerings, these were for dedication. He was dedicating this ark to the service of God. Dedicating this place to the service of God. And so in this celebration time, and it was a big deal, in this celebration time, David provided food for everybody who came to the celebration. You can tell they were Old Testament Baptists. They gathered together and had food. Just something about Baptists that love to eat. I I, I know I do. By the way, I don't know if it's the rain or whatever, but I haven't heard very many amens. And you would think at least on eating there would be amens. But let me try this again. Baptists love to eat. There we go. That's better. And then he appointed the Levites. Now you remember the Levites, they were the guys in charge. They were the priests. The priesthood came out of the tribe of Levi. They were the ones responsible for the tabernacle. They had to carry the tabernacle. They had to set up the tabernacle. When it was set up, they had to maintain the tabernacle. They had to watch over it. But it's amazing to me that David appointed some people as a full-time job. Levites, verse number 4 tells us, to give thanks and to praise God. Think about that. Their whole job, they'd get up in the morning, they'd have breakfast, they'd kiss their wife goodbye, they'd head to to the tabernacle, and the entire day, their job, their responsibility was to praise God. They would go home at night, they'd have supper, they'd do, I don't know, play Parcheesi or Scrabble or who knows... uh, Uh, they'd uh, uh, have their devotions with their family, maybe play some catch in the yard, and then it'd be bedtime, they'd get up the next morning, they'd go back to the tabernacle, and all day long, they would praise God. Somebody said, hey, what do you do for a living? I praise God. What's your dad's job? Oh, he's a praiser of God. Where does your folks work? Well, my mom, she takes care of the house, and my dad, he praises God. I want you to get the idea, this was a full-time deal. He spent his entire day, his entire career praising God. And yet, as we read through the Scriptures, I find that one of the most often given commandments to the people is that we praise God. And, And most of us forget that responsibility. What does it mean to praise God? The dictionary definition is recognition or commendation given to someone or something because of what they are or what they have done. 
And so praise simply means recognizing what God has done and thanking Him for it. The Bible is very specific that it's the responsibility of every single person, saved, unsaved, Christian, non-Christian, small, medium, large, young, old, Everybody is supposed to praise God. Psalm 17, verse 1. Oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise Him, all ye people. Listen to me. Everybody in this room is supposed to praise God. I didn't even have crutches. Everybody in this room is supposed to praise God. Nobody is accepted. Nobody is exempted. Nobody gets a buy on this. Everybody, young and old, everybody in this room is expected by God to praise God. So let me ask you a question. How much time did you spend today praising? It's early. How much time yesterday? How much time this past week? You see what I'm saying? And I'm certainly not just preaching to you because the thing about preaching is you've got to preach it to yourself first. And as I was preparing this message, I, I, I don't mind telling you, I got under conviction because as I realized how very little I did what I'm supposed to do, I had to ask God to forgive me and make some specific steps to get this in order. But everybody, each of us, all of us, are expected to praise God. You know, you can't pray properly without praising God. Psalm 100 verse 4 says, Enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. It says if you want to come into God's presence, you come with thanksgiving and with praise. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Now in order to get your prayers answered, obviously you have to be saved. You have to be a Christian. God doesn't answer the prayers of unsaved people. In order to get your prayers answered, you have to be right with God. You can't be involved in sin. Psalm 66, verse 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And so, in order to get my prayers answered, I have to be right with God. I can't be doing wrong. I have to be right with God. I can't have some habit that I know displeases God. I have to be right with God. I have to be completely and thoroughly and absolutely right with God to get my prayers answered. Now, I'm not talking about being perfect. I'm talking about, you know what's wrong? Stop it. You've been doing wrong. Ask God to forgive you and start doing right. And so in order to get your prayers answered, you have to be saved. You have to be right with God. But number three, you have to praise Him. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. And so praise is a vital part of getting our prayers answered. Not only is it required, but it's reasonable. Psalm 107, four different times this verse is quoted. Exactly the same, four different times in Psalm 107. It says, Oh, that man would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness, for His wonderful works to the children of men. You say, well, Brother Hal, I, I, I guess I need to praise God. How do I do it? You just recognize, praise Him for who He is. Who is He? He's Almighty God. He's our blessed hope. One of these days, He's coming for us to take us to heaven. That is our blessed hope. He's our comforter. He's our deliverer. He's the eternal one. Everything that we see is temporary. All that we gather is temporary. All that we uh, could hope to accumulate is temporary. God is eternal. He's our Father in heaven. We live in a time, sadly, when not every home has a mother and a father. And yet God promises that He would be a father to the fatherless. And so we can praise Him that although our earthly home may not be all that we wished it was and all that we hoped it could be, we have one who is an everlasting father. Praise Him for who He is. He is God and He is good. You know, I know that it's, it's 
something that we say, and there's nothing wrong with it certainly, but uh, oftentimes uh, something happens in our life that's, that's wonderful and we say, wow, God is good. Well, let me tell you, even if something bad happens, God is good. God is good. You've heard it. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. And so, if we needed to praise God, we could just park there for a little while and say, God, thank you that you're good. Thank you that you're God. Aren't you glad that He's in control instead of you? Aren't you glad that He's in control instead of me? Amen. My wife, amen, that one. He's holy. In a time of shifting standards and disappearing boundaries, God is holy. He is Emmanuel, God with us. When Mary learned that she was going to have a child, when Joseph learned that Mary was going to have a child, When Isaiah prophesied way back hundreds of years before the Messiah came, the the Scripture says that a virgin would conceive and bring forth a son, and he should be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. My little brothers, I'm, I'm three years older than my brother, younger than me, and five years older than my youngest brother. Whenever they would get in trouble with some of the other guys, whenever there was an impending, I don't want to say fight, but it was kind of a disagreement with fists. They would always want me to be around. Because the way that it worked at my house is is, uh, I can pick on my brothers because they deserve it, but nobody else could pick on my brothers. I remember one day we, we lived in Jackpot, Nevada, and our house was the very last house before the Jackpot Elementary School. There's nothing beyond the school other than sagebrush and mountains. And so I came home from lunch, and I'm looking out the window watching for my brothers to come home for lunch, and I noticed between my house and the schoolyard, there's a fight. Well, I always like fights, so I ran out the back door and headed down to see who the fight was. Well, there were two new kids in our, in our school. It was Roger DeVore and his brother Charles, and Roger... And Charles were two of them beating up on my brother. Now Roger is a year older than my brother and Charles is a year younger than my brother, but it's two on one and they're beating up on my brother. Now I don't know who started it, probably my brother, but you're not going to beat up on my brother and let me watch. And so, so I just, I, I saw what was happening and I tackled Roger and I, I hit him one time, but he's real slippery and he got away and I got up to chase after him. Meanwhile, Charles picked up a piece of cinder block and he's going to hit me and he threw it at me, but he missed me and he hit Roger right in the face, right in the eye, knocked him on the ground, blood squirting. It was great. It was wonderful. He's laying there screaming, oh, my eye, my eye, my eye. and I walked over and I said, hey, teach you to mess with my brother. And I got my brother and we went on home and had lunch. He went on and got stitches. If there's a fight, I'm on my brother's side. I got good news for you. God's on your side. Emmanuel, God with us. There is never a time that God is not with you. What a wonderful word of comfort. We can praise Him for who He is. He's the joy of living. He's the kinsman, redeemer, the light of the world. He's the merciful one. He's the one who promises never to leave us nor forsake us. He's omnipotent and omnipresent. That means He can do anything and He's always everywhere. What a wonderful God we serve. He's the Prince of Peace. 
He is the quieter of my fears. He's the redeemer. He's my savior. He's the trusted one. You know, sometimes people will let you down. Sometimes they'll break their word. Sometimes they'll go back on what they said. But you can always trust in God. He cannot lie. He's the unparalleled one. He's the one who's victorious over death and hell and the grave. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by Him. Thank God we can praise Him for who He is. We can praise Him for what He's done. There was a time when God became flesh, offered Himself as a sacrifice on that cross of Calvary, suffered and bled and died so that you and I might go free. During the American Civil War, the state of Missouri was was neutral. And so, oftentimes, it was battleground between the north and the south. The town in the northern part of uh, Missouri, called Palmyra, was occupied by the Union Army. It was one of their headquarters in the area. But there were many Confederate sympathizers who lived in the area, and so snipers shot ten Union soldiers. Well, the commander of the, that group of soldiers in Palmyra called all the men of the town together. And he said, ten of my soldiers have been shot. He goes, I don't know if anybody in this group did it or you didn't, but ten of you will die in payment for my ten soldiers. And so every man was to write his name on a piece of paper and placed in a hat. And the names were drawn out of the hat, and those ten men were to face the firing squad. There was a young man in Palmyra. His name was Willie Lear. Willie didn't care anything about the north or the south. He was just a young man who helped his father to farm the family farm. But because he was 18, he was gathered with the other men. His name was in the hat. And the names were drawn. And as each man's name was drawn, he was taken over and lined up with his hands tied behind his back to face the firing squad. They drew the first name and the second name and the third name and Willie's heart with the other men in the town was pounding, hoping and praying that his name wouldn't be selected. They came to the eighth name, the ninth name. He drew the tenth name and it wasn't Willie's, but it was one of Willie's neighbors. A good man. A man that had a wife and several young children. And so the neighbor of Willie Lear was lined up with the other nine whose names had been drawn. The commander gave the order, ready arms, and the men aimed. Aim. All of a sudden Willie says, stop, stop. He says, sir, I don't know about these other men, but I know this man's innocent. Please, please, he has a wife, he has children. And the officer said, I'm sorry. He said, ten of my men have died. Ten of these must die. His name was drawn. I don't know a more fair way to do it. And so he gave the order again. Ready arms. Aim. And Willie said, stop. He said, sir, I don't want to die, but this man has nobody to care for his wife, nobody to care for his children. Would it be possible for me to take his place? And the commander said, oh, I never heard of such a thing, but yeah, I just, all I'm concerned about is that ten lives are paid for ten lives, sure. And so the neighbor was let go free and Willie joined the ten. And for the third time, the order was given, ready arms, aim, fire, the shots rang out, Willie Lear slumped to the ground. He was dead. If you go to Palmyra, Missouri today, there's a statue in honor of Willie Lear. The inscription says he gave his life for another. In a very small way, what Willie did for his neighbor is a picture of what Jesus Christ did for all of us. He who was not guilty, he who knew no sin, became sin for us 
that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. You want to praise Him? Praise Him that He gave His life for you. Praise Him that He saved you. Remember that day when you were lost and on your way to hell? You were under such conviction because you knew that you were a sinner and you knew you deserved punishment. But one day you heard about the love of God that passes understanding. You were told that God loved you and Jesus had died to pay for your sins and He offered salvation as a free gift. And although you couldn't comprehend it, it seemed too easy. It made no sense. The Bible said, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so, by faith, you bowed your head and asked God to save you. And that day you got saved. God, just praise Him that you're saved. Praise Him for how He takes care of you day by day by day. You got sick and He made you well. You say, well, Brother Hal, that was medicine. That was doctors. That was all. No, no, He's the great physician. He's the one that gives you the air that you breathe. He's the one that empowers your limbs to help you to move about. He's the one that gives you clarity of thought or at least as much as you have. You ought to just praise Him for what He's done. Praise Him for how He's done, how He's met your needs. We were in Oregon and I had a blowout on my van. Went to the tire shop and said, I'm going to need a new tire. He said, what size? I said, about like this. <laughs> Evidently, they have numbers on them. So we went out and he looked and... Uh, he got the number and he went back into his little warehouse area and he came back out and he said, uh, he said, uh, I got good news and bad news. What do you want first? I said, well, give me the good news. I'm always optimistic. He said, I've got a tire that's going to fit. I said, well, that is good news. What could be the bad news? He said, well, it's a different size than your other three. And so I can't just sell you one. I need to sell you all four. I said, how much is that going to cost? And he got a little calculator, messed around like he really needed to. He said, that'll be $1,010. We were in evangelism. We didn't have $10. And Karen goes, she got a panic look. She goes, what are we going to do? I said, well, I hate to do this. We don't have any choice. We have to have a tire. We'll put it on the credit card and just pray that God provides the money, meets the need, so we'll be able to pay for the tires. And so we put it on the credit card. The next day, we got our mail packet. It came to us every Tuesday all over the country. I'm going through the mail. And there's a letter there from a guy who used to attend our church years and years and years ago. I I, I thought, I wonder what Phil wants. I opened the letter, and there's a check. No, 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 no letter, just a check for $1,000. I looked at that, and I said, Oh, oh. Karen goes, what is it? I said, oh. And I started crying. She goes, what's the matter? I said, mm-hmm. and She looked at it and she started crying. And then I grabbed it back because I want to make sure I read it right. You ever read something you thought it said a thousand, it was only a hundred? I grabbed it back and it was a thousand. And I said, oh man, I, thank you. And then I thought, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I still need $10. So I went through the rest of our mail pack. You know what? There was another check in there for $50. That happened probably 12, 12 and a half years ago. I am convinced I will never forget that. That never happened before. It never happened since. But on a day when I needed it, God said, I'm going to let my child know that I'm taking care of him. And today I can stand before you and praise God that he takes care of him. I love the old song that says, it's not so hard to praise Him when I think of all He's done. But we don't praise Him like we should. It's not that we don't mean to, it's just that we, we're, we're too busy. We're too regimented, we're too ritualized. We, just, we have so many things that are important, and we forget what is most important. We ought to praise Him for... What He will do. One of these days, He's going to take us to heaven, give us a grand new body, reunite us with our loved ones, and allow us to spend forever and ever and ever with Him. 
Let me tell you what happens when you praise God. Number one, it pleases Him. Psalm 33 verse 1 says, Praise is comely for the upright. Number two, it provides a a testimony to others. Psalm 40 verse 3, He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. He put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God, and many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. Hey, you want your unsaved family members to have their hearts softened? Maybe you ought to just praise God a little more. You want those folks at work to, to, to uh, you want to be able to present the gospel to Him? The Bible says if we praise God, many will see it in fear and trust in the Lord. Psalm 22 verse 3 is an amazing verse. Listen carefully. But thou art holy. Thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. If you want to visit me, you come to where I live. If I want to visit you, I say, what's your address? And I come to where you dwell. If you're going to fellowship with somebody, you have to meet someplace. The Bible tells us, and this, this is, it just thrilled my heart. I'm, I, I'm not over it yet. It says that God inhabits the praises of His people. You, you want to you spend time with God? You, he, he lives in the praises of His people. Amen. You want a fellowship with God? You praise Him because that's where He dwells. In the praises of His people. If you're not saved, you ought to still praise Him. But if you are saved, I don't know about you, but when I was preparing this message, I felt so ungrateful thinking about all that God has done for me and how very little time I spend. On my daily prayer list, I have a prayer list written out and I add to it and take from it. The very first item on my prayer list says, praise the Lord. But you know what? I go over that item like I go over most of them. Check, 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 check. I've been working on this message for about three weeks now. And I got to tell you, God has been grabbing my heart. And now I don't just check, check, I stop. And I think about who He is, what He's done. And the songwriter was right. It's not so hard to praise Him when I think of all He's done. Church, my challenge this morning, let's determine to praise Him. This is not a get right, get going, get busy kind of sermon. This is a sermon that will help you every day from now on if you grab a hold of it. Let's praise God. Bow your heads, please.